Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's C2C Back to Business NWA series uh, webinar that we are hosting here with the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce, Rules, Regulations, and Running a Business with COVID-19. As the world has changed and as things continue to move forward and then backwards and then forward and all, all sorts of things, uh, as Cami and I were, were talking a little bit earlier today, just things just change so quickly. Um, it, it's good to just have updates and, and have an expert like Cami Scott to be able to come in and uh, just help businesses as we're navigating this process going through COVID. So I am Steve Cox with the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce. Before I turn it over to Cami, I do want to say uh, thank you to all of our sponsors for today's program. Cox Communications is the sponsor for all of our Chamber to Community programs. And then also Chambers Bank is the series sponsor for the Back to Business NWA series. So this, this is being recorded. Uh, we will be releasing this through the Chamber's YouTube channel as well as through our social media networks. So if you know someone that was unable to attend the call today, uh, please feel free to forward that to them. I'm talking to you, Kathleen Hoffman over there. Send this out to Sherm. I think they'd be uh, very, very grateful to get something like this. But um, so I uh, just want to thank you. Uh, if you do have questions during Cami's presentation, please feel free to unmute and uh, ask, ask a question uh, as she is talking on that. We, we discussed that earlier. So I am going to end my part there and turn Turn this over to Cami Scott with uh, CK Harp and Associates, and she's going to take us through uh, tick, tips and tricks on running the business in COVID-19. Cami, thank you for joining us today. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you to each of you who are here today. I do appreciate you being on, and I did ask Steve if he would fix it so that you can ask questions, because I know how I am. If I wait until the end, I, I forget what my question is, and often I lose the context of it. So if you do have questions, please feel free to unmute, ask those questions, or if you have an idea, because as Steve and I were talking, the rules are changing. They're changing all the time. And, and Shauna made reference to that earlier that, you know, every day you have this new guidance and these new things that have come out. And I, I was supposed to do this presentation um, just about two weeks ago, and I went back through my slides and I had to re-edit several of my slides because the, the information has changed with it. So, you know, if you have have an idea as you are reopening, uh, please feel free to share that because the great thing about the, the chamber is that it really, it's designed to build a community of businesses, a community of people that can come together and that can share and that can support each other. And so that's a great benefit of the chamber. Um, even if you're not a member of the chamber, you know, which I would encourage you to be, then you can still take advantage of those tools and of those resources. So I'm going to share my screen here. And when I do this, there we go. Um, as I go through here and as I go through all of this information, you'll notice this is a little bit different presentation that I give a lot of times because although this has some of my thoughts in here, a lot of this we're talking about CDC guidelines and we're talking about um, OSHA guidelines, we're talking about governmental guidelines and so I have put those guidelines up here so that you can see them and you can reference them because even last week, last week I was talking with a government official and they said, hey, here's the rules, but as you know, even within those rules, there's still some, some gray areas with some things and some room for interpretation. And so with this changing so much, OSHA and some of these different groups have said, hey, we're going to give you some flexibility with this, but I wanted to give you the source. Where is this coming from so that you can actually go through there you can check for yourself. You can see where this information is coming from and what it says. So let's jump into the material here. So today we're going to talk just a little bit about the background. Where did this come from? Because I think there's some things as much as it's been talked about on TV and the radio and the newspaper and social media and every place else, there are still a few things that are still a little bit of a mystery um, to us as we go forward. And then we'll talk about where we're at right now. And as I said, things are changing, There's a, they're evolving, they're changing quickly. So let's talk about just where we are right now. And I'm comparing that to where we were um, just a couple weeks ago, because it's changed a lot. 
and then recognizing the risk. What is the risk? What's the risk to your business? What's the risk to your workers? How do you look at that and how do you assess that risk? And then how do you protect your workers once you know what the risk is? You got to know what the risk is first, but then how do you protect your workers? And how do you control that protection? And how do you control the spread and then some resources as well? And I will make this available if anybody wants it, I put my email at the beginning of this. I put my email at the end of this. Steve has my email. If anybody would like this, because this has a lot of references, and then I have a separate reference sheet at the end as well. So lots of things that you can go back to and check. So a little bit of background information. Most everybody knows um, that the virus supposedly started in China. Now there's some information that maybe it didn't start there, maybe it started someplace else, or at least that it started much earlier than what they thought that it started. When you go back and you look at the, the, the Google images, and when you go back and you look at some of the, um, some of the different autopsy reports, there is some information that it at least started much earlier than they thought that it would have started. And, you know, sometimes we think about, well, this is a brand new virus. Well, it is. This is a brand new strain of that virus, but there are actually six other human coronaviruses out there. SARS, MERS, those are also COVID um, viruses. Those are also coronaviruses. So there's other things that are out there. Now, March the 11th, that's the key date because March the 11th is really when the World Health Organization, when they declared this to be a pandemic. This is when they said, okay, things are changing, things are coming to a stop now. So the coronavirus is seven. I said six a while ago. It's seven when you count it. Um, really, it causes respiratory illness in people. And one thing that we don't think about, we talked a lot about the fact that it came from a bat. Some, some people say, some people say that it didn't, but it's known to circulate among animals. Um, camels, cattle, cats, bats, they all have various different forms of the coronavirus. And there are actually vaccines that are available for both cattle and dogs. I thought that would be of interest to everyone. We've still got a lot of cattle in our area. We've still got a lot of agriculture in our area. But there's a, there's a vaccine for the coronavirus for cattle and for dogs. And with your viruses, you know, you always have different variations of viruses. And so I put this up here just as an example. Um, smallpox, chickenpox, monkeypox, those are all in the same family of diseases. Different types of viruses, they cause different things. And so different coronaviruses, they're all different diseases but they affect people differently. And depending upon that strain, that is how it affects the person. And that's how it affects um, and how it can be treated, how you can uh, develop a vaccine with it. That's how that works. And so we've had the coronavirus for a long time. So if someone says, well, let's talk about the coronavirus. Well, obviously right now they're typically talking about this, but there's also SARS, there's MERS. Those were two bigger ones that have come about in recent years. All right, so by the numbers, and I had to change this up just a little bit, but my background is in numbers. It's in statistics, I know, I, I'm a recovering numbers person. And so I always like to see, well, what do the numbers say? What, what is this indicating? What is this telling us? So our total population in the United States, it is 331,022,651. Our total number of cases, and this was as of yesterday, is 2.5 million people. So 2.5 million people have been diagnosed with this. It's still a relatively small number. However, it's growing a lot. If you look here, um, this was on 612, which was when I was preparing the last time to do this, and then we rescheduled it. Uh, that wasn't that long ago, it was 18 days ago. So we've had an increase of 459,481 people in 18 days in the United States that have been diagnosed. So as you can tell, it's moving and it's moving very quickly. We still have a relatively small percentage of people nationwide that have it, but it is moving and it's growing quickly. Here's our deaths on here. 
Um, never, never a good thing to talk about. Um, 126,000 people in the U.S. have died from this. So that's an increase of 10,000 people, 10,000 people in 18 days. So that's a pretty big number of people that that's affecting. Now here in Arkansas, which I'm going to guess that many of you, you know, you're going to have businesses in Arkansas or you wouldn't be on here. Some of you have businesses in other states, and so I've tried to make this as generic as possible. Here in Arkansas, we've got a population of 3,038,999, okay? So our total number of cases now has reached 20,000 cases. Um, 618, it was 12,501. So that's a pretty big increase. We've had an increase in deaths, and then particularly here in Northwest Arkansas, because as you all know, Northwest Arkansas has been a hot spot as of late for this. Um, we've still had a big increase in our cases. Uh, since I've been prepared to do this, we've had an increase of 1,273 here in Benton County and 1,613 in Washington County. So we're still accounting, there's 75 counties in Arkansas we're accounting for a large percentage of that. So if you have a business in this area, it's more important than ever to keep up and to be looking at what the latest tools and what the latest information is. So what about some legal concerns with this? Well, you know, there's been over 2,600 lawsuits that have been filed this year. 1,300 of them have come just since May the 1st. So there's been a lot of lawsuits that have been filed in a really short amount of time. The employer groups, they're working hard lobbying Congress and they're lobbying for these liability protections, but there's still a lot of them out there. And I'm gonna talk about Arkansas in just a second. Um, some examples, some examples of some of the lawsuits. There was a fired nursing home employee who told her boss that she was going home to self quarantine. Um, negligent suit against Prince's Cruise Lines for failing to warn passengers of the risk. Uh, as you know, that was one of the very first places for this to outbreak. And then the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they're lobbying for protections as well with this. And so these, these lawsuits, they're going up and up and up. I saw one um, just yesterday and it was filed in Iowa um, regarding to some, some workers in a processing plant the number of lawsuits are going up and up and up. However, however, in Arkansas, the governor signed the executive order 2033, which is for the purpose of protecting Arkansas businesses from liability related COVID-19. And I put a link for this. I put it in the resources uh, page that I have available to everyone. And this is really aimed at protecting Arkansas businesses and it's designed to help businesses feel more comfortable in opening. So the first thing you've got to do when you're looking at this is you've got to recognize the risk. And you gotta see what's, you know, what's the risk to the employee? What is the risk to the business? How do you assess that? And what, what's that gonna look like for you? So the first thing here is you've gotta look at your worker risk. The worker risk, it depends really on how, how do your workers work? You know, what's their background? What are their medical conditions? Do they have other underlying health conditions? Because as you all know, older workers and workers with underlying health conditions, they have special risk. They have things that are, are going to put them in a higher category towards getting this and towards having really severe symptoms with, associated with it. Because some people, they have it and they don't even know that they have it. I, I visited with somebody last week and they had worked outside. They'd always operated heavy equipment. They'd done construction. They went to go give blood because somebody in their family needed blood. They went to go give blood and it came back that they had all these antibodies. And uh, they'd gone to the Red Cross and the Red Cross was contacting them regarding the antibodies. And they had no idea that they'd even had it. However, you know, those people that are asymptomatic, they can be the ones that actually spread it the most. So you have to look around and see what is your worker risk. So everybody still with me? Give me a thumbs up or 
uh, something here if you're still with me. All right, so let's talk about your classifying worker risk. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's talk about classifying worker risk. When we're looking at a worker risk, OSHA has divided your job task into four different categories. Very high, high, medium, and lower risk. And they put together this risk pyramid here as they're going through. And this is pulled straight from their website. And these are your four different areas. Most of your workers are going to fall into this lower category down here. There's fewer that fall into the medium risk, fewer still in the high risk, and fewer still in the very high risk. So when you're looking at your workers and you're looking at you know, who they are and what they do, you have to look at what is the chance of them being exposed? What, what is your job? What are you doing? Because really, you need to think about what are your job duties? You know, what, what does that worker actually have to do? Are they working face to face with people? Are they working from home? Do you have safeguards in place? Maybe they're a checker, but even though they're a checker, you've got all the plexiglass in there, all the safeguards in there. So what's their exposure risk? So your lower exposure risk are gonna be people that are working remote. They're gonna be office workers. Maybe they're long distance truck drivers driving by themselves, or maybe there's somebody else that's, um, maybe they're designing something, but they're working in an office job. So they're people that just don't have a lot of interaction with people. They don't have somebody close. Um, they don't have somebody that's right there with them. Next is your medium exposure risk. And these are jobs that require frequent close contact with people. Okay, so people in this could be, um, could be travelers, it could be people in schools, it could be people um, that are working in a, in a retail setting, people that are going to have frequent close contact. So it could be a restaurant in here. Um, it, could be, it could be somebody that's coming and looking for additional information. It could be maybe a, a parts store. Your high exposure risk, these are your jobs with high potential for exposure. So somebody that's working in a doctor's office, okay? Maybe just a regular doctor's office. We're not talking about a COVID clinic here, but we're talking about just a regular doctor's office. You know, people get sick, they come in, Many times they do testing there because they'll do it through the private labs, but not always. So they have a higher risk. Your medical transport workers, those people are gonna have a higher risk. People that work um, in mortuaries, people that are around people in close conditions who are ill, they're gonna have that high exposure risk. Then at the top, you have your very high exposure risk. Your very high exposure risk are your jobs with very high potential. Um, they're people that are gonna be your lab workers, your healthcare workers, your paramedics, um, your firemen, people that are working directly with people who are infected. Those are your highest risk people. And so if you are in that setting, most of those are going to be medical settings, you're already used to having PPE. You know, you're used to having that type of thing. Whereas if you're in a retail setting, you're probably not as accustomed to having a whole lot of PPE. You just don't typically have to have that unless you're cleaning or unless you're lifting boxes or um, working with something where you have to have steel toed shoes. You don't typically have to have a mask or gloves or those types of things. But there's an adjustment for workers in in all categories with this. So as I mentioned briefly before, you have to look at what are the job duties? You know, what does the person do? And that's key. And really, if you're looking at your business, you wanna know what your workers do anyway, because that's important for OSHA, that's important for assessing your risk, that's important for productivity, that's important for a, a whole myriad of different things but you have to look at it now 
in terms of what did they do? What are their interactions with one another? And what are their action interactions with the public? So as you're going through here, you have to think about how could you restructure that job? What do they need to do? What duties are, are really important in association to this? And what could you restructure? How could you redo it? You know, you could restructure a few things when it comes to your emergency response team, your firefighters, your law enforcement. You, you can re restructure that some, but some of their stuff, you can't restructure that. You, you can't. Whereas some of your other things, you can restructure that a little bit more. Maybe if you're in construction, since I know Shauna's on here and she's got a lot of folks that are in construction. Um, if you're in construction, you know, maybe you give some people to some instructions to your workers that they separate just a little bit more, you know, that they use hand sanitizer because many times they're out on a job site and they don't have any hand sanitizer out there typically. You know, you might have a little bit or maybe you don't have water readily available um, on a routine basis. So uh, what are some things that you can do consciously to help to protect your workers with that? So the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to think about what are your duties that your people have to do? What are essential to getting your job done and, and making sure that your business operates? Because if you can't structure it in a way so that just your business can operate or operate efficiently, that's going to make it tough to open and tough to really work. So what are the job duties and can you restructure that? So how does it spread? And I, I put this cat up here because you know, there were a few cases where really it, it was with tigers and it was with some other stuff where people had gotten this, they'd gotten it from their pets or they, they got it from another animal or they got it for something else. So, you know, possibly it originated from animals. Um, that's That was the official thing that was said. And then it was said, no, it, it wasn't. Yes, it was. But you know, there's really not a lot of evidence that companion animals can get it and spread it. However, if you do have companion animals and someone is infected and, and maybe they're, uh, they've got a cat or they've got a dog or maybe it's a service animal, a companion animal, and, and maybe someone is really loving up on that, you know, they're really cuddling with that kitty or, or that, that puppy and, and they're really holding it close, but they're infected and then another person comes along and they do the same thing, you could have some cross-contamination by that. But as far as it jumping from an infected animal to a person, that typically just doesn't happen. It's almost always, almost exclusively, um, and I say almost just because there were a couple of, of instances of it, person to person transmission. So we all know we've got the X's on the ground and, and I saw a meme on, on Facebook. I thought this was really funny that um, it had X's everywhere and it said, you know, this has got to be hell for pirates, you know, because they're always looking for X marks the spot with it. So most of your places have marked six feet apart where you're supposed to stay. Um, respiratory droplets. You can be uh, infected from touching infected services, uh, surfaces. Um, so you need to make sure, make sure that things are cleaned. Make sure that your surfaces are clean. Make sure that you're cleaning your doors, your countertops. Make sure that you're cleaning anything that's a high touch surface. You need to make sure that you're keeping it clean. Is there any questions so far? Okay, no questions. Steve, that must mean that I'm either doing really good or they're already COVIDed out with this. One way or the other. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the first option. I like it, I like it. <laughs> So let's talk about protecting your workers. What are some guidelines and standards? And this is an area where I've put lots and lots of links in here and given you lots of pages of information. And once again, I'll be happy to share this with you. <clears throat> 
you know, OSHA has a number of different tools, a number of different resources that apply to preventing this. And so, you know, you've got several different standards that apply when it comes to OSHA. And I'm just going to hit the high levels on this. Um, and then you can go in here and you can look and see specifically what these things say. And if anybody is, is stressed and unable to sleep, read this stuff. It'll help you out. You'll be able to sleep with this. So the first one is OSHA's Personal Protective Equipment Standards. Now, these standards talk about, you know, what you have to wear for various different positions. Um, if you have to wear gloves, eye uh, protection, face protection, respiratory protection, it gives the guidelines for that. Next is the general duty clause, and this is what all businesses are subject to. Now, not all businesses have to keep records, but all businesses are subject to your OSHA, your general duty clause, which says um, you've got to have a hazard-free environment. Employers have to provide a place of work that employees can come to, which are not likely to cause physical harm. The third different guideline that's really key in this instance is OSHA's Bloodborne Pathogen Standard. Now, the reason that this is so important, because the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, it applies to bodily fluids as well, which the number one way that this is transmitted is by people that are close to one another, speaking to one another, and you have these aerosol droplets, which are bodily fluids. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to the bloodborne pathogens, the general duty clause, and the personal protective equipment clause. So in addition to OSHA, they're the, the overall, your federal guidelines, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, in addition to that, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act, sorry, um, you do have 28 other state approved plans. And these are plans that are required to have standards and enforce programs that are at least as effective as OSHA, but, but, they may have more stringent requirements. So you may be feeling like this person right here, you've got your head down because in every state, you can have different requirements. 28 of them have OSHA approved plans. Um, California, California has by far um, the most guidelines and is the most restrictive. So if you just have an, uh, an office or a business in Arkansas, then you don't have to look for these other things. But if you are operating in multiple states, you need to make sure that you're paying attention to, do they have any state guidelines? What do those guidelines say? And how are you going to follow them? So we all know we have to clean stuff up. You know, you've got to keep it clean. However, when you're cleaning, some of those chemicals are hazardous. So you need to make sure that as you're cleaning and as you're disinfecting, that you're also following all of the guidelines for that. And so there are some exposure guidelines, some disinfection guidelines, and I've put links to that. You need to make sure that when you're using these, that your workers have that personal protective equipment on them and make sure that you're following all of those guidelines for your, your MSDS. Make sure that you've got those material safety data sheets put together. Make sure that you have, you know, your, your proper PPE for it as well. I know that, you know, it's kind of tough to get that sometimes. The chamber has helped with that, but it's kind of tough to get that sometimes, but make sure that your people are equipped for that. And especially if you're using cleaner, you're going to be using it a whole lot more if you have a restaurant or if you have a nail salon, if you have a place, a retail place, you're going to have lots of people coming in and out. And so you're going to be using these cleaners a whole lot more. Well, you need to make sure that you have those protections for your workers in place because if they only clean one time during a shift, their exposure levels are not that much. But if they're cleaning every hour or every 30 minutes, or with, with some restaurants, I've heard of them, you know, changing out their gloves and changing out their stuff after every, you know, 
every customer, every exchange with a customer. So a customer gives them a credit card and they're changing gloves. So that's a lot. You got to make sure that you're prepared for that and prepared with your cleaning as well for it. Some additional standards that you need to be aware of. I mentioned this briefly just a second ago. If you've got 10 or more employees, then you need to make sure that you're keeping your records on it. And there's the OSHA form 300, there's the, the 300A, there's the 301, there's several different ones in there, but make sure that you're keeping records, make sure that you're keeping records if someone is injured, if someone is hurt, and make sure that you're covering your personal protective equipment with that. There are some basic program elements as well for federal employee safety standards. Um, I've listed the link for that once again. This is a little bit different presentation because normally I don't list this many resources. However, this affects all of us. Typically when I talk, I'm talking to a specific group of people. In this case, there's tons of different industries out there. So you need to know where to go to find these. Plus, they're changing. My goodness, they're changing every day. They're changing all of the time. When we were just getting ready to come on, I just saw another update here um, on a safety standard that was just changed. So you need to know where to go to find these resources. So OSHA released their interim enforcement response plan. They released this on April the 13th, and it was in effect until May the 25th, and then they came back out and they changed it. So lots of changes are taking place. Um, this is in place right now, but they have these interim enforcement plans. So you need to make sure that you're reading those, that you know where those are and how that's going to work. They've also said that they're going to give a little bit of discretion with this and that once again, when I was starting off, I talked about you need to know where this is. And if you have to make a judgment decision, I know Kathleen Hoffman's on here and a lot of times what she says is document, 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 document. Why did you make the decision? Why did you do what you do? Even if it's wrong, if you can justify why you made the decision, you're still going to be better off with this. So make sure that you have your set of guidelines, which I'm giving to you, make sure that you have that. And then if it is a judgment call, make sure that you're documenting why you're doing what you're doing and how you are attempting to comply with it. Because they said that they are providing some enforcement flexibilities, but you need to make sure that you're trying to follow those guidelines as close as you can. Does anybody have any comments on that? Kathleen, you have any comments on that? This is a quiet bunch today, Steve. So Cami, in a nutshell, like we talked about before everyone got on here, it's just, it's just ever changing. I mean, I'm trying to plan an event in September and October and I don't even know, I want to, I want for the events people, I know it's a little different than um, the business, but we still have to cover ourselves and make sure that the people running the event are cleaning and following guidelines. And I don't even know what to send to them at this point because it's going to change so much in three months. So. I agree. I agree. Thank you for sharing, Shawna. Yes, it is changing. It is. Any other comments? Okay. So workers' rights and responsibilities. And uh, you've heard a lot about this in the news with it. One of the big things is make sure that you have an anti-retaliation program in place. Make sure that you have a way for people to submit complaints to submit their worries, but then make sure that you have a anti-retaliation plan in place. Because if you have a worker that comes to you and says, I'm concerned about this, or you are not meeting this guideline, and then you retaliate against them, 
you can be setting yourself up for problems with the EEOC, you can be setting yourself up for problems with a whole variety of other government agencies if you are retaliating against that employee with OSHA, with all different types of groups, you are setting yourself up for problems. So if you have an employee who comes to you and who brings you a safety concern and you are, are not answering them, you need to. You need to, and you need to document what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and make sure that you address their concerns. Now, they may not feel that you've addressed it all the way, but as long as you feel like you have addressed this, that you have, have certainly answered that concern, and then not retaliate against them. Because if you retaliate against them, and then there is a, um, a wrongful firing, once again, you're setting yourself up for a lawsuit. So be aware of this. Be aware of how employees can submit complaints. They can submit ideas. They can talk to you and then some recommended um, practices for anti-retaliation programs. And really, when you're talking about this, you're talking about your supervisors, you're talking about your managers, you're talking about people that have um, the opportunity to hire someone, to fire someone. So if someone brings a complaint to you and if they say um, you know you're supposed to be clean we need we have a high volume of customers who are coming in here we need to be cleaning more frequently and then you say no 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 we don't need to be cleaning more frequently but then um, you perhaps put them at a, at a worse job at a more physically demanding job at a job where it's very cold where it's very hot uh, those are some examples of retaliation with that. So be aware of that. Be careful with that. Control and prevention. So what do you need to do in the workplace in order to control this? So remember, this is not a one size fits all. It's not. So you have to go back to your chart here that I've started with. Which category do your workers fall in with this? What are their job duties? What are they going to do? How are they going to do it? How is it all going to come together? Make sure that you know where do your workers fall on this and what are you basing that decision on? And then you can go back and you can reference the OSHA guidelines for each of these different groups. So, but the first step though, is making sure that you do a hazard assessment for your place of business. Here's some general guidelines on this, and these are just overall guidelines for us. Um, make sure that you are encouraging your employees to wash their hands. You know, wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Do it for at least 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, Make sure that when you're running, that running soap and water are available. Use an alcohol-based hand rub with at least 60% alcohol and wash your hands that are visibly soiled. Make sure that you're talking to your employees. Make sure you have those signs posted, that you're encouraging them to do that. I know most people know to do that, but when you have that sign up there, that's just another encouragement. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Avoid touching those surfaces. I know nowadays many people are, they're, they're wearing a face mask. You know, many of our cities and, and our government, our governor, uh, government officials, they're all encouraging us to do that. However, um, you know, we're not accustomed to wearing those. And so you have to be careful that you're not touching something, touching a surface with your hand, and then taking your same hand and pulling your mask down, pulling your mask up, pulling your mask down, pulling your mask up, you know, then you're just contaminating yourself because you've touched a surface and then you've touched your mask. So you need to be aware of that when you're, when you're wearing that mask. Practice good respiratory etiquette. You know, cover your mouth, cover your sneezes and coughs. Avoid contact with people who are, who are sick. Stay home. Encourage your employees to stay home if they're sick. Um, there's some paid medical leave for businesses that are under 50, which I'm guessing that many of the people who watch this are going to be in that category. There's some paid leave and there's some tax credits for that. So 
encourage people to stay at home. Because if you have somebody that comes to work and you tell them to stay there, that it's fine, stay there at work, then they make everybody else sick, that's gonna hurt your productivity even more. So encourage them to stay home. You need to make sure that you're recognizing what those risk factors are. Uh, make sure that you're looking at that. If you know somebody has a condition, let me be very clear with this. If you know it, then you may want to assign them differently or maybe alter that if at all possible. However, do not, do not, I'm gonna say this one more time, do not go to somebody and say, hey, are you sick? Do you have any pre-existing conditions? Are you a diabetic? If you're an employer and you're doing that, that can get you in all kinds of hot water. Don't do that. Don't go ask somebody if they have an underlying medical condition. But you want to be sensitive to that if you know someone has one of those underlying medical conditions. So there's a fine line there that you have to walk with it. But I'm going to say that one more time. Don't go ask your employees if they have underlying medical conditions. You got to be careful with HIPAA with this. That's your Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. You have to be very, very careful with that and be careful um, that you're not violating that. Like if you're taking temperatures or um, if you've got some different forms that are coming in, be careful. Identify and isolate. You know, if you have somebody who is suspected of having COVID, move them out of the room. Get them out of there. If they're on an airplane, you know, try to move them to a different, a different place. Um, you don't always know. People get test results at all different times. So if somebody's test result comes in, um, or if they find out that perhaps they've been with someone who has been infected, you know, move them out whenever you can. Take the steps to limit the spread of this. Make sure that, that um, you put a face mask on them if you can. If somebody can't tolerate it, you know, that, that's a fine line there. In most types of workplaces, those that are outside of healthcare, then you need them to leave the work site as soon as possible. You know, if, if you find out that they've got family members that have it, that are living in their household, be careful with that. And it sort of depends on the severity too, um, on when they're going to be able to come back and not come back. Healthcare workplaces, that is a whole, whole different ball game. And your healthcare workplaces, they are, they are working on that nonstop. Those rules are really changing. But you wanna make sure that you're protecting your workers and make sure that they're wearing that correct personal protective equipment. Close contact. Close contact is closer than about six feet. So for um, those of you who don't like people to be really close to you and you've got those close talkers, we all have them, the people that get really close and they get in your face and get in your space, uh, this is a good opportunity for you. You can tell them, hey, you know, I'm practicing social distancing. This gives you an opportunity for that. Um, if you're gonna be closer than that, be sure that you have on your personal protective equipment. Make sure that you've got your mask on. Make sure that you are, are if you know, necessary, wear your gloves. Do what you can to make sure that you don't have any of those um, aerosol secretions coming out. Make sure that you're, you don't have any coming out and that there's none coming back to you. So close contact. Uh, if you're passing somebody in the aisle at the grocery store and they're passing behind you, that's, they're close to you, but that's not really close contact. Close contact is when somebody is uh, doing your nails, a hair salon, uh, a dentist office, somebody that is working really close to you. Or if you're looking over, uh, maybe if you're looking over a set of blueprints, maybe you need to provide two sets of those blueprints so people aren't quite as close with that. But just analyze, once again, analyze your job, analyze your job duties, and think about what close contact is. Environmental cleaning, I touched on this a while ago. Uh, if you have contaminated surfaces, 
make sure that you are cleaning those. Make sure that you're cleaning those um, as per the CDC guidelines, which are changing all the time. But make sure that they're cleaning those and make sure that you're following the guidelines on that. And once again, remember your PPE for your people who are cleaning, not only for the COVID-19, but also for those hazardous chemicals that they may be coming in contact with. As I mentioned, there are some specific cleaning instructions. The CDC has those. They have them for healthcare facilities, post-mortem, laboratory, other. Um, I would encourage you to pull those up. You can pull them up. You can print them off. Once again, document, 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 document. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? That is just a good protection for you. The guidelines are out there. You can say, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's the guidelines and the rules that we're following. Here's how we're trying to make a good faith effort to follow through and to protect our people. Because remember, as an employer under the general duty clause of OSHA, you have a legal obligation to ensure that you have a safe workplace. Businesses that are open. So you need to make sure that you're continuing your routine cleaning. Make sure that you clean and disinfect um, on a routine basis and that you're following the guidelines with it. And make sure that you're using the EPA registered disinfectants. Not everything that's a cleaner is going to disinfect, okay? So some of the all natural cleaners, some of those work, some of those don't. So make sure that you are following through with that. And if you do have some of those more hazardous chemicals, um, if you're using bleach, if you're using some of those heavier disinfectants, make sure that people are wearing those respirators, that they're, they have the proper equipment on them so that they don't have any skin burns, um, they don't have any burns to their lungs, and make sure that you're providing those uh, safety data sheets for them, talking about what it is and how to use it. A caution, you don't want to use any compressed air or water because uh, that can potentially just spread it. If you're doing a full-on cleaning and if you've got somebody in a hazmat suit, maybe in most instances, you don't want to do that. Worker training. You want to make sure that all of your workers are trained. Make sure that they know what to do, how to do it. Uh, make sure that you've got a policy in place, a procedure in place for training them. You've got proper protocols in place. Um, make sure that they know what to do and how to do it. And make sure that you schedule this during regular work hours. So you can't make them come in an hour early and have training with them and then say, well, that was off the clock. Now you're going to clock in. If they're there for training, you have to pay them and you need for you and for your protections, you need to make sure that you have that policy in place, that you're documenting, that you're doing that training. Who's there? Who's conducting it? How long does it last? Where did you pull your material from? You need to make sure that you have all of those things in there. Make sure that you have that standard procedure for training. Make sure that you have training for PPE. I touched on this a while ago about your hands. Make sure that you're washing your hands. Make sure that you're using PPE correctly. If you are touching surfaces and then you're pulling your mask down, you're contaminating yourself. If you have gloves and you are wearing gloves, but you're touching everything around and then you're touching your face, you're contaminating yourself. If you have gloves and you start to take your gloves off and you don't follow the proper procedures of pulling them off, if you start pulling them from the fingers with your hand that is ungloved and then you're not washing your hands, you could be infecting yourself. So make sure that your workers are trained on when to use it, how to properly use it, and make sure that you're paying them to put it on and to take it off. You've got to do that. So you can't tell them, hey, you got to come to work and you've got to put it on, but we're not going to pay you for that. You have to pay them to put it on and to take it off. Make sure that you've got the proper areas to dispose of that and to disinfect it. You got to make sure you have a way to get rid of that. 
Um, inspect for damage. You need to make sure everything is in good shape as well. And that you know what the limitations are as well. Do you need an N95 mask or do you not? Do you just simply need a cloth mask on there? What can you use? What can you get by with? You do have these standards as well. Um, for PPE, for eye and face, hand protection, as well as these training videos. Now, for small businesses, generally you don't have somebody who has all the time in the world to put together a training video. You don't have somebody that's dedicated to this. So OSHA has a variety of training websites and training videos that are available. Bloodborne pathogens, I talked about this earlier, when the potential exists for exposure to human blood, certain body fluids, or other potentially infectious materials, then you have to have the training on the bloodborne pathogen. So like your dentist offices, um, your doctor's offices, your medical facilities, they all have this type of training already. The OSHA training and reference materials, this is great for people to go through and for businesses <clears throat> to help them as they're training and as they're preparing, and as they're training their employees. Make sure that you're training them on how to use this and make sure that you're getting it to them. Make sure that they have it. Um, you need to make sure that they have it based upon their job duties and you need to provide this to them, okay? So you need to make sure you have it on hand and make sure that you're prioritizing it so that if you have somebody who's working in a high risk situation, they have the right materials. So opening your business. Are you gonna open or are you not going to open? If you open, you have this decision-making tool up here with the CDC. And basically they're asking, is it legal to open? Are you ready to open and to protect your employees? If you don't have the right cleaning supplies on hand, if you don't have the proper safety precautions in place, then you're not ready to protect them. Are recommended health and safety practices in place? Most of the time this is going to be changing up what people are doing and is ongoing monitoring in place? Do you have a way to monitor and to check people and ensure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? I was at a place of business yesterday and it's a very good place of business. However, they had the face mask rule in place. Their people would wear the face mask up front and as soon as they went to the back where they were all working very close together, on projects, they were taking them off because the people enforcing it were not in the back. So make sure that you, you mention that. Here's some additional guidance and thoughts, and, and these are just, these are some different ideas for you. So, you know, OSHA does a lot, but there are other rules. There's HIPAA, there's state rules, there's CDC guidelines. There's all kinds of information out there. The Arkansas Department of Health Remember with Arkansas Department of Health, they say that cubicles are not social distancing unless they are six feet apart. So that's just some good practical advice for you. You gotta make sure your cubicles are six feet apart. And the rule of the cubicle is not considered to be a barrier. When you're taking temperatures, that's a medical exam. You have to do that in private, okay? So, you're not to be talking about what people's temperatures are. I know some people are doing it in very different ways, but they do say that those are to be private. You need to write a policy and you need to make, it your, make sure you're consistent with it. Have a policy, stay with it. You need to have that Arkansas notice on the employee entrance door. Make sure that it's posted there and you need to have that notice on your customer entrance door as well. Uh, make sure that you have your postings available as well for your employees with that Family First Corona Response Act, FICRA. Make sure that you have those up. Be sure that you have your PPE and that you're providing that for your employees. And make sure that you have your new safety data sheets in place. Make sure that you have any changes that you need to document to your hazard communication program and that you have your training in place. Even if you're using OSHA training, 
You need to have a plan in place for your training. Make sure there's a new notice that is from the Department of Workforce Services. Make sure that you have that. Anybody that you terminate, they are supposed to have that. Uh, I mentioned the door, notice on the door to the public. Remember HIPAA, take it in private. You can ask for a doctor's note. You can ask for that as well. Uh, you can ask questions on a standardized state approved form regarding contact with someone with symptoms. So you can't ask certain questions, but there are certain questions that are approved. Think about if you go get a haircut or if you go have one of those other personal services, uh, if you go get a manicure or a pedicure or a massage, those are those standard forms. And you cannot disclose the names of the people who are infected. You can't do it. Uh, that violates a number of different rules. You can't talk about that. So some closing thoughts, and I know we've covered lots of different stuff. I mentioned I do have a resource list handout with links to websites for you. Um, and I've put my email address up in just a minute. You can email me, you can email Steve, we'll get that to you that just has that list for you of those various different resources remember that the rules are changing. So I've put together this list. It's a list of websites for you, of places for you to go. Check back there frequently because there's changes all the time. Have a written policy and make sure that you follow it. Make sure you have that policy in place. Document, document, document. Document what you're doing and why you're doing it. Pull that information, pull those policies, pull those guidelines, document what you're doing, put it in the file. Have a cleaning protocol, a cleaning procedure, and make sure that you're documenting that. Make sure you have enough PPE in place. And be sure if you're operating in different states that you have those state guidelines in mind as you're crossing state lines. These are a couple of different things to think about too, you know, uh, Things are just changing. They're changing all the time. They're changing every day. Uh, I, I talked to a friend of mine in California recently and she's always talking about, oh, well, I'm flexible. And she is, she, she is your typical California girl. Um, she's always go with the flow. Let's just, let's just go with it. Um, not everybody's geared up that way. So this is a big, a big shift, a big shift in mind. And so I had this, this quote, actually, it came up on Facebook this morning from Winston Churchill, that success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And in this day and age, it certainly, certainly does take a lot of courage to continue and to keep going with this because each of us hit that wall and we each hit it at different points with this on what do we do, how do we do it, how do we overcome this latest hurdle. So just remember, success is not final, failure is not fail, it's the courage to continue that counts. Also remember that the chamber is here, I'll put a plug in here for you Steve with this, the chamber has lots of resources, the Rogers Chamber, the State Chamber, the U.S. Chamber, they have lots of different resources that are out there. Plus, the Chamber has lots of other businesses. You know, you've got that business directory. Reach out to people who are in similar situations as you. A great benefit of the Chamber is bringing businesses and bringing people together to learn and to grow with each other. So make sure that you're utilizing that part of the chamber. If you need help with that, I'll gladly volunteer Steve's services for that. I'm sure he'll be happy to help you coordinate and, and connect with someone who might be able to help you. So thank you so much for being on here today. Thanks for watching, Steve. Thanks for helping to put it all together. I appreciate it. Um, if anybody has any final questions, I'll be happy to field those. Here is my contact information. If you all would like this set of slides, if you would like the resources, or if you want to sign up for our newsletter, just shoot me an email and just let me know and we'll be happy to share those. Steve, with that, I'll turn it back to you.
All right. Well, thank you, Cami. We appreciate you taking your time to, to share this. this was, as you said, it was a lot of information, but it was all useful information. I was taking notes and things during it myself. So, uh, But as you did mention, the Chamber does have some resources available. Um, we do have a COVID-19 resource page. We have a reopening guide. We link to CDC, the State Chamber, uh, the U.S. Chamber. You know, we, we have a lot of resources on there, as well as our C2C Back to Business NWA series are all, all of the sessions that we've done. Uh, we've done at least two a week uh, through for the past couple of months and they are live on our Chamber YouTube page uh, as well as uh, through our social media and this this one will be available on there uh, either later today or uh, first thing tomorrow morning to be able to, to share that out to your contacts as well. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you being part of the C2C Back to Business NWA series and as always with everything the Chamber does we do have to thank our sponsors because without their support and the support of our members, uh, we would not be able to, to be able to put on programs such as these. So thank you to Cox Communications, as well as uh, Chambers Bank for sponsoring all of our uh, C2C programming and Chambers for the Back to Business NWA series. So thank you all again, and uh, we will see you hopefully uh, when we start getting back to meeting in person. We won't have to be doing this via Zoom anymore. So uh, hopefully soon that'll be happening. So again, thank you all everyone, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you.